All right, hello and welcome to another Pedro Worldwide Journal Club. Uh, today we'll be discussing a systematic review on the effectiveness of progressive and resisted and non-progressive or non-resisted exercise in rotator cuff related shoulder pain, uh, which was published by Josh Norton in Clinical Rehabilitation. And so today we have four panel members uh, with a mix of experience in terms of research and clinical practice. So to begin, we'll go around and introduce everyone. So I'll kick us off. So my name's Josh Sadro. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow and physiotherapist. Uh, most of my time is spent in research at the University of Sydney, uh, but I still practice in a private musculoskeletal clinic on the weekends. Uh, hi, I'm Laura Crowell and I'm a musculoskeletal uh, and uh, sports and exercise physio um, and currently doing my specialisation in musculoskeletal physio. I work in private practice in a rural area and have yeah real interest in the application of evidence into the patient in front of you everybody my name is peter maliaris i uh, am an academic at monash university i work there four days a week and then the other day a week i work in clinical practice hi i'm dominique murphy i'm a uh, first year grad at uh, Liverpool hospital Awesome. Thanks everyone for joining us. So what are the key implications of these findings? We, we have some emerging evidence that uh, potentially doing exercise a certain way is going to be beneficial. And that is more progressive and resisted exercise. So until now, a lot of the reviews that are in the literature, they're, they're quite blunt, you could say. And what I mean by that is they, uh, they clump all the exercise together. So they don't uh, recognise that some exercise is different to other exercise in the way that it's done. So that was sort of the key underlying motivation to do the study. We wanted to see whether if you look at exercise that is progressive and resisted, does that differ to placebo or uh, no treatment? And, and it seems like it does, but I guess the big caveat on all of that is that the evidence is very low certainty and there's not many studies. So we still need to be very cautious with implementing what we have at the moment. I might throw this question to Laura and Dominique. So what types of patients uh, should we give progressive resistance exercises to? I guess when you're looking at rotator cuff weakness or shoulder instability, the question that always comes up and sometimes can be misprescribed is really acute tendinopathies. Yeah, I think it was quite interesting that the discussion didn't include full thickness tears, which I'm keen to hear Peter's thoughts about where that's going to go. I mean, I think it really depends. I'm, in most situations, you're looking at giving some sort of loading for any sort of cuff-based pathology. But in terms of the degree of resistance and the the strategy that's utilised, it really comes down to the patient in front of you and taking a whole range of different factors into account too so in terms of what that resistance is it may even be just anti-gravity to begin with and then progressing up from there but I think there's the potential to apply a graduated program as long as you've actually made sure that the person actually does have a proper cuff pathology and that you've differentiated out from the neck I see a number of cases where people present and they've been doing cuff problems and their problems actually originating from the neck. So it was really good to see that there's very clear exclusion criteria in these sort of studies to make sure that that has specifically been excluded. Are there any people with rotator cuff related shoulder pain where progressive and resistance exercises wouldn't be appropriate? It's a really good question because one of the frustrating things from our systematic review was that none of the trials really report adverse events. If you progress the load more, then it's more likely potentially to have adverse events with people who are unaccustomed to heavy loading and or progressive loading. But none of the trials really uh, went into that or reported that. But I think from a clinical standpoint and um, interested in other views as well, but it probably would be something that pain or uh, the level of exercise um, experience that someone has would come into it to try and minimize say adverse events and uh, potential to flare up with more progressive exercise. I think everyone can benefit from progressive and resisted exercise it's just what you define that as being and then what what grade of what speed of progression 
So I think if we've got, you know, as I said, if you need to start a patient at a very low level, you can still progress and the pain is definitely going to, and irritability affect the speed of progression. And it would actually be quite interesting to know the criteria by which people choose that, that progression when to actually do it clinically versus maybe a more structured progression because there would definitely be some people that would have adverse responses to that. The interesting thing about pain, I guess, too, being subjective, we found patients that had a lot of pain had poor compliance to completing any of the programs that we would set. That makes it very, I guess, tricky to take data if, if people are compliant. I know that did come up in the paper as well. And I guess maybe if I'm thinking of a special type of population, say an athlete that's involved in like a throwing sport and their pain is caused from overuse of throwing, is there still a role for resisted exercise in these patients or is it more a matter of just rest from the aggravating activities and then slowly build up? I think you can still be doing a progressive program, but it's important again that you're not progressing them into pain. So night pain is one of the biggest indicators that when you've overdone it. So you can still rest them from, you want to rest them enough to take them out of that really acute phase, but then still be progressively loading them. And even if that's loading the scapula more, more while you allow some, some acute rest periods, I guess. It's a really interesting question in relation to the mechanisms. So, because uh, one of the things that sort of is implied in the uh, systematic review is that the mechanism for people getting better is that you're going to give them, you know, this more intense exercise and they're going to get stronger and they're going to have more benefit. But there's no strong evidence that I'm aware of that the mechanism for people getting better is just, you know, simply the strength that we, that they can benefit from if they do more progressive exercise. And it may be that there are other mechanisms like, for example, psychological changes that happen when you allow them to load heavier or, or other factors that can mediate some of the response. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's a very biomedical approach to what's ultimately, ultimately a multifactorial solution, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So if you look at the biopsychosocial model, it's not just about the, the physical aspects and there's, there's the other aspects that we know are really important as well. But the, the other point I just wanted to make quickly on that, and that was from uh, something that Laura said about pain um, and also Dominique, was the one of the real debating points in the literature at the moment is how much pain people should have when they're doing shoulder rehab. And we've done one survey with physios in Australia that, that there was real divide, pretty much almost half and half split between people that would and wouldn't exercise into pain, which was really interesting. And also the same came across when we surveyed a group of patients and we asked them, you know, what were they told about exercise, whether they should be exercising into pain. From, from the studies in the trial, it seems like a little bit of pain with rehab is, is okay and is not going to be a problem. I think that's really highlighting that um, complex biopsychosocial approach too. In the, again, we're looking at so many factors that will determine in the patient in front of you whether you're likely to progress them into pain or not. For example, an athlete might be used to, like a lot of elite athletes are used to working into a degree of pain and may actually really struggle with, you know, keeping the load at a low enough level. And for them, maybe allowing a very light amount of pain provided that they're still able to maintain their performance and not experience an increase in their symptoms might be okay. Whereas if you've got someone very fear avoidant, they're the sort of person you want to get them into a pain-free rehabilitation program and build confidence in the capacity of their arm. Now, and that's the type of data that only comes across in qualitative interviews. Uh, not in the surveys that we've done where we've just asked people. But that's, yeah, that's really good insight. And I think um, I, would, I would probably agree with that. It's very context specific in terms of where you, know, where you might go into pain, where you might not. The, some of the theories out there are related to, you know, potential inhibition of muscles and change in motor patterns if there's too much pain. I don't know if there's a lot of evidence for that, but uh, some of the other arguments like you put forward around biopsychosocial factors, that, that does make sense. 
Yeah, I think the clinical challenge of patients in pain when prescribing exercises uh, is quite a common one. Dominique, I'd be interested to hear how you go about explaining to patients the exercises when they come to you with pain and particularly pain when they do the exercise. How do you, uh, how do you convince them? Oh, it's, it's tricky. And um, just because I'm, and also because I'm starting out in my physio career, it's one that I have to kind of run to seniors sometimes if can't seem to educate on pain and that big movement that it, it doesn't necessarily mean harm if there is a little bit of pain, but it's tricky. And I guess I've asked other fellow new grads who just started out in private practice and, and it is a challenging thing, but I think like everyone's kind of mentioned, it's a very holistic approach. You kind of have to kind of sit down with the patient and work out what program is for them. I guess it is just more uh, educating the patient. Do we know what the optimal dose is for progressive exercises and are there certain training parameters that are more important than others for people with shoulder pain? And when I say parameters, I mean things like the frequency someone does the exercise, the amount of reps they do, the time under tension, all those sorts of things. I'm going to sound uh, very vague here because it totally depends on the individual in front of you again and what their goals are. Probably the main thing I'd say is what is the thing that will progress the most towards what their goal is. So if their goal is sim simply to be able to put the milk in the fridge, then, you know, speed's probably not going to be a huge issue. Whereas if you've got an athlete, then they're going to need to have various issues around speed, different starting positions. They might have frequency issues if they've got to th throw multiple times, endurance, that sort of thing. So I would say whatever brings them closest towards their goal. I can offer an opinion from the paper. We looked at this carefully in terms of what parameters people have prescribed, and we weren't able to get a real good indication of the level of intensity that is beneficial. I don't think any of the papers reported intensity, so MVC or percentage of RM or uh, other ways of measuring intensities. And, th and that's probably the same for a lot of other parameters. They don't really report them very well. Uh, from a research point of view, I have to say we, we don't have much idea currently about that question. The, the preliminary stuff that came out um, from the reviews that we've done around this is that there is some benefit from loading them more and uh, doing more generally, but there's, so, there's such a wide variation and that probably reflects what Laura's talking about, how individual it is. Yeah, because it really comes down to building that capacity for that individual and looking at what the difference is between the, the current capacity and the desired capacity and then bridging that. But it's amazing how few study report on the specifics, I think, whether it's for the shoulder and any other area of musculoskeletal rehabilitation. The oldest study, studies I've seen seem to read have been very vague on their, on their parameters. So if... Uh, exercise for shoulder pain is individualised and there's no optimal dose in terms of uh, loading or frequency. How do you determine what the target dose is for an individual and, and how fast should you get there? I think part of it is around principles of tissue adaptation and that could be when you're trying to rebuild function but then also looking at whatever uh, functional requirements that they have. So whether they need to do things that involve say rate of force development or speed or lifting heavy things so looking at building capacity but also tissue adaptation so combination of those two things in the clinical world you're always looking at first of all balancing pain and making sure that pain is uh, not initially aggravated or improving with loading in those initial phases i think that's where there could be great variability because there's no real guiding principles for, the, for that. And I think similarly, it applies the stage of the um, tendon continuum model. We can use that to help stage and plan a bit of a progression. If someone's in, we know that in the shoulder, we can use that model. So if someone's in that reactive phase, then obviously you're going to take quite a different approach to someone who has relatively degenerative tendons. And so the progress is going to be very different at different stages of the continuum. Just to hit on Peter's point again. So it's interesting because I guess there seems to be less of a focus where the pain's happening with exercise 
but more of a focus as to what happens after exercise. How do you explain this to patients? Oh, it's actually really tricky and I, I, I wouldn't really know what to say to patients. I'm actually kind of interested in what Peter and Laura have to say about that because I think it really determines if they're going to be compliant with the program. So it's really key to get that right, I think. I think for me, it comes down to really thorough and good education. It is very individual, depends on the conceptualization the patient has about pain. So if they are thinking a certain thing about pain, challenging those beliefs, you know, I'm definitely in the camp of allowing some pain with exercise as long as they have a favorable response after. I think it does come down to the education and allowing them to really uh, understand that uh, if they have pain, it doesn't correlate to damage, just those simple messages, but getting it across in a way that is really going to convince them. And it could be various strategies. Like for example, I see a lot of Achilles patients, it's often related to just making clear how strong the tendon still is, even though they might've had it for five years. You know, messages like that can help them to think, reconceptualize what they think of as a very uh, fragile tissue and thinking about it in a, in a different way, um, I think is helpful. And I think that's a real issue in, um, in the shoulder and especially in the rotator cuff because they've had all this really nocebic language like tears and impingement and oh, it's so much negative input before they even start that so often that concept of pain is like, okay, what's tearing next? And so it requires a lot of education. I find in my clinical population anyway, almost to back them off a bit and to train them that into that capacity so that they develop confidence that they're not necessarily going to be doing damage and in, and in pain that way and to really be educating them progressively, almost from a point that's a little bit too light to build them into that. I think that's a, that's a really good point about the language in the rotator cuff because most patients have got imaging reports and something has come up, something has been shown. I think for patients, it's very intuitive to believe that a tear um, in a tendon needs some sort of repair. And we know that that is not necessarily true and you don't need to do anything about it necessarily. But that's a very hard thing for patients to understand. And I think the medical model is still really supporting that. There are some very prominent physios that pretty well will determine whether a rehab's likely to be successful based on whether the patient believes they need surgery. And pretty well, in, if in their initial assessment that they're saying, yes, I think I need surgery, that he's going, ah, well, we probably can't help you then because they have such ingrained beliefs. I wouldn't be that strong personally, but it really does come into play. I think there's a missed opportunity, though, to challenge patients' beliefs and to be trying to change the way that they are viewing their problem. Exactly. And great beliefs are a chance for a challenge accepted. And do, do these views change if it's a full thickness tear or are we just referring to partial thickness at the moment? That's a... Good question. There's a number of prospective cohort studies at the moment on looking at cuff tears and how they progress over time. They basically show that um, you've got a chance of that tear not doing anything at all over time, even if it's full thickness, it could stay the same. And these follow-ups are usually in a number of years, so two or three year follow-ups, or it could get bigger. It's not gonna get smaller. I present that to the patients and say, look, you've got a pretty good chance, 50-50 uh, chance of the tear not progressing. And even if it does progress, it doesn't mean your symptoms will necessarily get worse. So I think that's a good message for patients and they can then make their own mind up about the pros and cons of other interventions. And so would we still prescribe progressive and resistant exercise oh. for people with full thickness tears? I probably would, but over to you, Laura. Emphatically Some... agreeing, absolutely. I think there's evidence that these people do 75%, I think it is, do really well at two years and, and don't require surgery. So not everyone's going to be successful. 
But in a degenerative tear, there are studies that do support resisted exercise programs in full thickness tears. We've got to remember the ability for the, for the human body to compensate and still build that capacity and strength and function in that shoulder. After all, there's a lot of people with full thickness tears that are completely functional, don't even know they've got them. How do you measure progress in terms of load and, and when can a patient stop doing their exercises? I think that's a really good question. I guess for me, I deal with an older population that come in with tears. It's very goal based. And that's where we focus our treatment on being able to do things because, I mean, someone who's 65 is going to have very different goals to someone who's 75. We look at, you know, have they reached what they need to do? And I guess is it very functional? The question goes to the lack of any criteria that we have. And as you see patients, you sort of do develop a bit of a feel for, yeah, maybe this group of people, the older people with shoulder problems, the 60, 70 year olds, they, you might want to progress them to two or three kilos. You might get a bit of a feel for how much weight with elevation they generally get, get them to. But we don't really have any area or what we should be progressing people to. And it's very population specific and I guess individual again. So previously we mentioned that maybe the benefits that people get from progressive and resisted exercise isn't from increases in strength. And I think there are some papers in, say, the back pain literature that say uh, people do a strengthening program, their symptoms improve, but their strength measured objectively doesn't change. If that's the case, what is it separating you know, that progressive exercises are effective at the moment and those non-progressive, non-loaded ones are ineffective? So if it's not the strength gains between those two different protocols, that's explaining it. What else could it be about those progressive exercises that's making the improvements in pain and function? That is a tough one. I'll offer just a little bit of insight from the paper. In the progressive group, there were differences in other factors. So I think three of the trials did supervised exercise. And in the other group, there was less supervised exercise and that could impact on adherence. It may be that people who are getting stronger and feeling like they're progressing are a bit more motivated and then they start to do more exercise. It might also be that just giving someone the okay to lift heavy weight has some sort of positive effect on them psychologically because they're thinking, if I can lift this three or four kilo weight, then surely I can do other things. So it might have flow and effects to self-efficacy with general daily life and activities. Peter said it really well. I mean, in that paper, especially the supervision element, um, I think is a really big factor. And the potential positive reinforcement that comes with that. I hadn't really thought about the increased capacity as how that then empowers people elsewhere to go and do other things. Whereas I think if you're doing the same load again and again and again, I think there's a certain degree of lack of or monotony and lack of progression that may not build confidence. And so is there any role for non-resisted or non-progressive exercises for shoulder pain or is that just a complete waste of time? I think doing something is better than nothing. And with older generations, educating and just doing something, I guess, has a role there because we want them to start participating and just doing anything that will um, hopefully make them feel better and guess and participate in other elements in, in areas in their life? I think there's a role, but the role is maybe multifactorial, as you're saying. Um, it's about uh, help encouraging healthy lifestyle and reducing comorbidities and that sort of thing versus directly necessarily changing cuff load. So I think you put that really well and I think that's it. so valuable in that population that you're dealing with, Dominique, versus like most important in that population. Although the earlier we start it, the better off and hopefully the less comorbidities when they get older. I would also agree and I think probably is um, good to progress at some point. Um, so doing something maybe light to start with could be, could be really beneficial. But you probably don't want to do 12 weeks of just raising your arm up and down. And you've recently had a fair bit of experience in telehealth, haven't you, Dominique? Do you want to tell us a bit about your current experience in that? 
Yeah, it's been tricky, like um, uh, everyone with this year and the um, COVID. We found, uh, especially with the outpatient department at the hospital, telehealth wasn't very popular and people weren't really comfortable us kind of looking into their homes and they would rather have a, uh, a follow-up phone call. So I guess for us, how we were progressing any kind of exercises was with TheraBands and we were looking at mailing them to people and having to kind of follow up that way. But it was tricky and people would say, I can lift half a bottle of milk or I can now lift a bit more in the milk bottle and things like that. But it was definitely tricky. Um, I'm sure everyone else is in the similar boat with dealing with COVID. But I'd be interested if anyone else has had much telehealth experience. Yeah, I've had a bit and I would mirror exactly what you've basically said. It was, yeah, very individual based on the patient. Um, some patients just don't prefer it and see it as a stop gap now that we're in this situation, there's nothing else to offer, but would definitely run back to face-to-face because they prefer. I think they get the comfort of someone really assessing them properly and uh, finding out that they've had, had a really good look and they know exactly what's going on. And so what strategies do people have for progressing exercises via telehealth? We were sending out TheraBands in the mail. That was in exercise programs and then following up with phone call and uh, it kind of going through it that way, which I think has lots of limitations due to the fact that you can't see somebody doing the exercises. And I think with a rotator cuff rehab, it is so important to see technique and you can see many people kind of cause other injuries because they're doing the exercises wrong. We've done mainly telehealth and I think it, it does lend itself quite well to progressing rehab. That's basically all the patients that I see via telehealth now, all I do is progress their rehab. It becomes a rehab review. Watch them do the exercise, progress the exercise, add a bit more weight or uh, regress or progress. And, but in terms of strategies, I just think keep it as simple as possible like limited progressions of one or two things uh, in a session um, is probably enough with tele-rehab. What are some tips that you have for maybe practitioners that are new to telehealth? I would say practice. Practice really does improve your confidence because I think as clinicians, we're all feeling a little bit not too confident with telehealth. Um, And then the patients are really anxious as well because they don't think they'll be able to do it or get what they want out of it. So just reassuring them and stopping intermittently during the telehealth and making sure that you're checking they're okay and they are you know, following on with everything because it's hard to get that rapport with people. Good language and good education. Using positive, encouraging language, video where possible and reinforce all the positives that you see. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, Thanks, Laura, Dominique and Peter for joining us today. Uh, That concludes the Worldwide Journal Club for Pedro. We'll catch you next time.